Well, good evening. Again, Red, uh, <laughs> welcome to Green Meadow Church of Christ. It's good to be here. It's good to have you here. Uh, tonight's topic, uh, title of the sermon is The Depth of Discipline. The Depth of Discipline. And why I call it The Depth of Discipline is because discipline isn't just like, it doesn't just mean one thing. It means many things. And tonight we're just going to talk about aspects, two aspects. Disciplining your children just like God disciplines his children, which are us, and self-discipline, all right? Self-discipline in adults, self-discipline for children, yes, but self-discipline for Christians. Self-discipline for disciples. That does, the word disciple, follower and learner, is very close to the word discipline. So let's consider those things. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 3 through 6 was read tonight because God was telling his people, why? Why? What was he doing during the time of the wilderness wanderings? He was showing them discipline, shaping them, forging them into the people that he wanted them to be so that they would learn something, that they would learn that man does not live off bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see? So, a couple questions here, right? Why do we need discipline? And we're going to answer that. What are the consequences for no discipline? We're also going to answer that. And what's the goal of discipline? I'll answer that right now. The goal of discipline, when it comes to parenting, the goal of discipline is to restore the relationship. It's not to just take your anger out on your kids because you didn't get what you want. It's not to get revenge because they didn't listen to you. It's to restore the relationship. All right? The goal of discipline for us adults or young adults or Christians, disciples of Jesus, yes, it's to restore the relationship, but it's also so that we have the self-discipline to glorify God, to obey his commandments, yes, but also be, have a worshipful heart, a grateful heart, and a heart that glorifies God. It takes self-discipline for this. It takes self-discipline to pray. It takes self-discipline to study, right? Does it not? I mean, it does. It takes self-discipline to set aside some time for God every single day. All right, so let's get going. So three points about the depth of discipline. Point number one is the representation of discipline. That's Jesus. He's the ultimate representation of that. Point number two, the requirement of discipline. It's required for all of us. And then point number three is the result of discipline. All right, representation of discipline, requirement of discipline, and the result of discipline. So point number one, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12, by the way. Hebrews chapter 12 which is the chapter that is mainly dedicated to discipline. So point number one, the representation of discipline. All right, so let's, let's go over a couple points of application like I always do for these points. When we see Hebrews chapter 12, it, it obviously comes after chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is a hall of faith. When we see all the saints that came before us, all these saints of the old, right? The Old Testament, heroes of faith, the hall of faith. And it's right after that, the Hebrew writer talks about this great cloud of witnesses, which are those people. They're rooting for us. I'm not going to tell you if they actually are watching us or actually see us, but they were witnesses to God's work, witnesses to God's glory, and they also want to see us in heaven, right? So those are the saints that were before us. And then we're going to talk about how Jesus is the ultimate representation, the ultimate example of someone that took God's discipline and became self-disciplined to the point of death on the cross, out of his love for God, for his Father, and out of his love for us. All right, so Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. I'm using New American Standard tonight because it uses the word discipline instead of chastened, right? So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us, you know when we see that, those, those two words together, let us, it's like, you know, you... Nobody's going to make you do this, right? We have free will. No one can make us do these things. But if we do these things, we'll reap the benefits, and God will too. All right, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin. Encumbrance is weight, right? And the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Obviously, discipline is needed to lay aside sin, to lay aside weights that are hindering us from our faith. 
It takes discipline. It takes self-discipline. All right, and obviously it's a race. You know the analogy that Paul likes to use a lot and the Hebrew writer? It's a race. And when we talk about people that win races long distance, because this is more like a marathon than a sprint, isn't it? So if we're going to liken it to a marathon, we know the, the tale of the tortoise and the hare, right? Slow and steady wins the race. You want it to be steady. You don't want to do, ah, and then, you want to pace yourself, right? And Hugh always talks about Hugh. You know, when, I say, when people say Hugh, some people think I'm saying you. Hugh DeLong often talks about balance in your life. That's very important. That also takes discipline, self-discipline. All right, so let's go to verse 2. How, how do we do this? How do we lay aside weight that's hindering us? How do we lay aside sin? Verse 2 tells us fixing our eyes on Jesus. That's what New American Standard says, fixing your eyes. When you talk about some, fixing your eyes on something, it's, it's like, whoa, I can't stop looking. Like you fix your eyes on stars if you like stargazing. You fix your eyes on birds if you like bird watching. I'm not really into either of those things, but you, it's, it's an analogy that, hey, that's all I can think of right now. All right, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. I love this. When we talk about authority, how Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, this is an aspect I like to talk about, that he's the author. He's the author of salvation, the author of life, the author of faith. From the original source, you see, fix your eyes on him. But look at the example that's being talked about. For who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's keep reading verse 3. For consider or ponder or meditate or imagine, that word means, think about him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. What do we go through, right? I know, we've gone th- I know many of us have gone through trials, suffering, hard times, aspects of persecution, but compared to Jesus, what have we gone through compared to what Jesus went through? Think about these things. Such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He's saying, think about Jesus and everything he's done for us, everything he does for us, so we don't lose heart, so we don't grow tired. You see, the ultimate example of some of that was self-disciplined after being disciplined by God all his life. Verse 4, yet, oh, sorry, different translation. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Have we? Are we bleeding when we try to stop sinning? You see, he's using the the contrast of Jesus on the cross and us trying to walk as Christians in the light. Are we to the point of blood, bleeding? And the answer is no. And it says, yet, because, yes, many Christians did die. Many Christians were martyred in the first century. We understand that. But what about us? In this day and age, in this country, are we bleeding? Are we dying for our sin in this country? No, we have freedom to worship God. We have freedom to be Christians in this country. And so let's use that freedom to honor God. You see, I I was just having a conversation with with someone, and she was saying, we're rich. And I said, I know, right? We absolutely, electricity, heat, water. And then we always talk about how we're the top 3% richest people in the world, even the homeless people here. Yeah, we're rich here, but we're, we're also more rich abundantly rich in heaven. But think about it, just the freedom and the privileges that we have, what are we doing with those things? Because we're not bleeding to follow Jesus right now, not physically, all right? Verse 5, I mean, not not yet. Point number two, the requirement of discipline. Why is discipline required? Discipline is required because the Hebrew writer says we're not legit children unless we accept discipline unless we're disciplined. And if you think about it, we're going to show scripture to prove that you're not a legit child of your parents either if they don't discipline you. Did you know that? That's what scripture says. It's going to talk about how parents really don't love their children if they don't discipline them. All right, so yeah, it's required to be legit children of our Father in heaven and our parents, earthly parents, and it's required to be self-disciplined. To share in God's holiness is the result. Verse 5. And you have forgotten, uh uh-oh, 
some of these Hebrews, the Hebrew writer had to admonish some of these Hebrews and warn some of these Hebrews that they forgot some things. It says, and you have forgotten the exhortation or the urge. Exhortation. This is from Proverbs 3. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. And that's not talking about literally faint, right? It's not like, ah, I'm going to get punished now. Right? <laughs> Grow weary, right? Verse 6. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. See that? He loves those who he disciplines. And so do earthly parents too. Loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. You see that? We've got to receive some kind of discipline to forge us, to shape us, to be more like the image of his son. It says God, God disciplines out of love, and so should we. Right? That was a super quick one, right? The requirement of discipline. Let's look at some more examples of Proverbs and discipline. You guys are probably very familiar with this, but we're going to review these things. Proverbs 13, verse 24. He who spares his rod hates his son. See that? But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. I hate my children if I don't discipline them, if I let them get their way, if I don't correct them, if I don't stop them from being unloving or unkind. You see? If they disrespect or disobey, if I don't correct that, or if they're dishonest, those are the, those are the three Ds. Disrespect, disobedience, dishonesty. Those three Ds in my household are addressed immediately. There's no exception to that. Just letting you know. Maybe you didn't want to know, but I'm letting you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so anyways, promptly, right? Not say, okay, I'm going to punish you in three months. You'll see. I'm going to surprise you, right? I'm going to get you, you know? Promptly address it now while the iron's still hot, literally and figuratively. It should be out of love, obviously. We don't want to do it out of unrighteous anger or selfishness. Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your son while there is still hope because eventually there's going to time, become a time where it's too late, Right? And, and often we have seen that. Heather and I have seen that. Even my kids have seen that. And other children, it's too late. There was no discipline. They're already 13 years old. What are you going to do? And it's like we've seen it even younger than that. Like arguing and reasoning with their mothers, trying to rationalize. And the mother just gives up and says, okay. Uh, I, like, she said no like 20 times in five minutes, and then she just gives up. That's not good. That's horrible. You see, when we talk about disciplining our children, we want them to obviously obey us. In turn, they will respect authority in general. Because if they don't obey us and they don't respect authority in general, if they don't respect authority in the workplace or in school, how can they truly respect the authority of God? You see, that's one of the things that we need to teach. All right, so anyways, uh, Discipline your son while there is still hope and do not desire his death. Because, look, spiritual and physical, that's the cost. Without discipline, there's risk of spiritual death and earthly death. Yes, actually dying, but a really bad life. Let's put it that way. Destruction. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 13 to 14. Do not withhold correction from a child... For if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. I showed this to my mom once. He started laughing. She's like, I like that verse. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh, man, I knew the Bible before you showed me. No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, verse 14. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. This is a big deal. Look what discipline can do. It can save souls. Deliver the soul from hell. That's how serious this is. Proverbs 29, verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. You see that? We just talked about an example of how um, the mother's trying to say, no, 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 no. And then the person's like, ah, no, I'm just going to do it anyways. And just do it anyways and get away with it. You see, the problem with our culture today is they want to talk to their children, right? Here, see that? We're going to have this nice little talk about what you did. Right? I know that you killed the tortoise by throwing it. I'm not even making this up. 
You kill the tortoise by throwing it, but you know, that's from not, is that the best choice you can make? Throwing the tortoise and you kill it? You see? That's not discipline. You see? Pain retains. Have you heard that? <laughs> Pain retains. All right. Let's move on. But look carefully. Gets, a kid gets their own way, brings shame, not only to his parents, but to God. And if we get our own way, we bring shame to the Lord, right? As adults, as Christians. Consider this, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. How Paul urges fathers to discipline their children. He says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. We can do that by overdoing stuff. We can do that by not doing it out of love. But let, let me talk about it more. It says, but bring them up in the discipline, King James says nurture, and instruction, King James says admonition, of the Lord. New American Standard is more hyperliteral. When we talk about nurturing, that's another huge misunderstanding that this culture has fallen into. Nurturing is like, nee, 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 right? Nurture. That's not nurture, okay? That's cherish. That's different. That word cherish is, nee, 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 right? I cherished Tristan when he was five pounds, 15 ounces. Until he got a little bit bigger, and I still cherished him. Then he got a little bit bigger, still cherished him. And then, and then he can crawl, and then that's when he said, hey, don't touch the dog food. And he's like this. <laughs> and then, oh, you're going to get swat. You're going to get, you know, and then he's like, <laughs> he's like, <sighs> what did you just do to me? You see, cher I still cherish them in a different way. But you see, nurturing is discipline. Not Disney nurturing, not Hallmark nurturing. Nurturing in the Bible is discipline. And instruction, admonition, is warning. In other words, sometimes you've got to hold your, your kid's feet to the fire to show them how serious stuff is. You've got to warn them about all these things about life. Things that they have to prepare for. Because when we're raising children, obviously we want them to grow up to be godly men and women. We want them to be saints that will glorify God and multiply disciples. You see? All right, let's go. Back to Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> now, this is interesting. King James says, if you endure discipline. So, just think of it that way. If you endure discipline, God deals with you as sons. You see that? If you endure discipline, then you are his child. You are really actually his child in that relationship as his child. It says, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? A real father, okay? Not a bad father, not an unloving father, because an unloving and a bad father will not discipline. Let the kids do whatever they want. But if you, verse 8, but if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. See, that's what the scripture says. No discipline, disciple, sorry, no discipline equals not legit children. Because no discipline equals no love, just like we talked about in the Proverbs. You see? One of the preachers that trained me told this story when he was a child. He had neighbors. He had one house over here, he would play with those kids, and one house over here, he would play with those kids. So with the house over here, he went over there, and it was utter chaos. He was miserable because there was no rules. Everything was absolutely chaotic, and he felt unsafe and unloved. Then he went over to this neighbor's house, and there were boundaries and rules, strict ones, and he felt loved, he felt safe, he felt happy. You see, we all need boundaries, we all need rules, we all need discipline. Because that's how we feel loved. Verse 9, furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? And I put up there, I'm, I am grateful for my father's discipline. I, I really am. Because like I said, I've seen the result of the lack of discipline in people's lives. And the lie, the, that path became the path to destruction in so many people that I knew. I can remember as far back as four, probably further than that, a little bit. I'm just going to give you one example of when I was four years old, we were eating dinner at the table, and then I, we were eating peas. So like, huh. Throwing peas under the table, right? Nobody sees me. And then afterwards, my dad's like, Brandon, come here. He's like, I want you to count the peas. 
I'm like, why? So I know you threw them down there. You count the piece, and you get one spanking per pea. I'm like, oh. So I counted 11 peas. I remember exactly. And I got 11 spankings with my dad's super hard lip. Like, dude, his hand is hard, and it's rough. Still to this day, right? I never threw food on the ground ever since. Not on purpose. I may have dropped an accident, but not, never again on purpose did I do that, right? Seriously. Let's flash forward to middle school. All right, so there's this time where we were at this. So you guys have HEB, but we have fries over there in Arizona. Kroger fries. So in the mid-90s, VIP, right? VI, become a VIP member. It was a new thing. If you, get a v, if you become a VIP member, then you get the sale. Then you get coupons. You couldn't do it without signing up. So what they do? They hang VIP signs all over the store on two strings. Every single aisle, VIP, VIP. So, you know, I love shopping, right, Mommy? Heather? I love grocery shopping because it's so fun. No, I don't. So, we're walking through the store. I'm like, you know what? Huh. So, I jump up and I grab the sign and I swing it. So, it starts going like this. And then uh, I'm looking at my dad. Oh, he doesn't see. He doesn't see. This is so fun. And then my sister's like, idiot, stop. Right? And then we go, we're eight rows in at least. So we got eight rows of signs like this, back and forth. I'm like, ha he still doesn't see. So I jump up to do one more, and guess what happens? Whoa! <laughs> His hand hits my face, and then I land on, on my behind, and I'm like, oh! And then my sister's like, she's dying laughing, she's red, she can't even breathe. And then my dad looks at me like this, he's like, stupid Brandon. Stupid. <laughs> yeah, so, but I'm grateful for that, you know? I shouldn't be doing that stuff. And there's another time, I'll just give you one more example. There's another time when I went fishing with my dad. And <laughs> so you guys, are you guys fishermen? Does anybody fish here? Does anybody know about those sonars on your boats? Yeah. So my dad carefully, and this is the 90s, remember? Those things were like not as good as today. And they're probably more expensive back then. So in the 90s, we went fishing, and my dad used his sonar to find fish. He wanted to find those lines, right? The lines of the fish. So he finds a bunch of lines. He's like, oh, Brandon, look at all these fish. So then he casts out like six rods, six rods with bar bobbers on them. He's like, okay, okay, everything's set up. So if the bobbers go down, set the hook. But I'm tired right now because I drove all night, so I'm going to take a nap real quick. Oh, lower the anchor. He told me to lower the anchor. So he puts his hat on like this, lies down on one of the chairs. He says, wake me up if you get fish. I'm like, okay. But he's like, but put the anchor down. I'm like, okay, okay. So the anchor that we had was like clover-shaped anchor. You know, like three clover thing. So I pick up the anchor. I'm like, all right, he wants me to lower the anchor. So I throw the anchor. That was stupid. You're not supposed to throw an anchor, right? <laughs> Boom, three giant waves. One wave covers my dad, one wave covers the, the, the sonar, and it destroys the sonar. So then my dad gives up, he's like, Brad! <laughs> and then, yeah, he's like, stupid Brad! And then, yeah, he kind of punished me a little bit, but anyways, I'm grateful for my dad's discipline. He didn't just let me get away with anything. And he was, he's a very strict Asian household, but still, you know, I'm not as bad as I could be if it wasn't for that. <laughs> All right, verse 10. For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he, God, disciplines us for our own good so that we may share in his holiness. You see? He wants us to share in his holiness. Jesus wants us to share in his holiness. That's why, that's the goal for him. Like I said, restoring relationship. Now let's talk about the result of discipline when it comes to Christianity. Discipline results in self-discipline, like I said. Self-discipline allows us to bear fruit. We're going to talk about that. Strengthen and straighten our path. We want to be on the right path. We want to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. And to live peaceable with fellow man. So let's go over this. Verse 12. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You see that? This is a good thing. We need this desperately. 
And we can't bear fruit that the Christian should bear without this discipline. And sometimes it's hard. Like the wilderness wanderings, they went through all this hard stuff, but they needed to look, remember that they, they had to completely surrender and rely on the Lord for everything. And we should feel the same, know the same things. Verse 12, Therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. It's our responsibility. He's telling us to strengthen our hands. You see that? He's telling us, you need to take this initiative. You need to take the initiative. You need to take the responsibility through self-discipline to strengthen yourself in your faith. Verse 13, make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame, this is figurative, may not, put, may, may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Again, this is figurative language. Self-discipline leads us to walking with Jesus on that straight path and leads to inner healing. Because sometimes we have wrong things going on in our heart. We have evil in our heart. We have sin in our heart. We have bitterness in our heart. We have lack of faith in our heart. But discipline, self-discipline, helps us get out of these lulls in our faith. All right, verse 14. Self-discipline helps us pursue peace. Verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. This is not that easy sometimes, right? People are not lovable sometimes. There are evil people in this world. There are annoying people in this world, right? But he says, pursue peace with all people and holiness. So pursue peace with people and pursue holiness. Remember we talk about holiness? It means to be wholly his with a W. Completely dedicated to him. He says without these two things you can't see the Lord. And there's two meanings to that. Remember how it started? Fix your eyes on Jesus. You can't fix your eyes on Jesus if you're not pursuing peace with people or if you're not pursuing holiness. But the worst thing that this could mean is that you will never see the Lord when you die. You won't make it to heaven, you see? This is one of the primary goals of the Christian, is to pursue these two things. All right, verse 15. See to it, your responsibility, that no one comes short of the grace of God. Sometimes the grace of God is misunderstood that it's, okay, yeah, it's freely given, but we still have to respond to it in faith. Like James 2 talks about, faith without works is dead. Right? You're not saved by faith alone. You see? So it's our responsibility to make sure that we're not short of the grace of God. And it tells us some indications. It says that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by, by it many are defiled, be defiled. We talked about this morning in class, when we were talking about the model prayer that Jesus gave. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You see, we can't hold bitterness in our hearts because that tells us that we're short of the grace of God. We're not in God's grace if we hold bitterness in our hearts and grudges in our hearts. Again, this requires self-discipline to pray, to study, to rely on God, to ask Him to show things in our heart, using the Word of God to cut our hearts and remove that bitterness. Bitterness. All right, verse 16. Also, it's continuation, right? That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau. And we all know the story of Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. And we can do that all the time. We can sell our status of being saved under, by grace. We can sell, sell our status of righteousness for idols, anything. And it could be as simple as something as a meal. And we shouldn't do that. I know there's way more tempting things than that, than a meal. Well, maybe. Well, I don't know. We love food, right? <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. There's all these snares of the devil that he sets up. And we don't want to sell our birthright, our salvation, our childhood in the Most High for anything. But that takes self-discipline. All right, verse 17. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. This is Esau. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. Esau wanted to repent, but it was too late. You see, there's always going to come a time where it's too late. It's too far gone. Isaiah 55 talks about that too. Call on the name of the Lord while he is still near. There will come a time where it's too late to discipline your children. There will come a time where it's too late to learn self-discipline from the Lord. 
So let that not happen to us. All right, so this is the conclusion. This is a really short lesson, right? I think. <laughs> the representation of discipline, Jesus. The requirement of discipline, self-discipline. Restoration and relationship. And the result of discipline, very good things. Fruit as the Christian. Holiness. Seeing the Lord. Not becoming defiled. Not falling out of grace. So a couple questions here before we end this lesson. Do we need to be better at disciplining our children? If there's anyone that... <laughs> can relate to that right now. And two, do we need to be more self-disciplined? And if so, let's take the steps to do that, right? Together, we can help each other do that. So if you're here tonight and you haven't given your life to Jesus, if you want to become a disciple of Jesus, to become a true child of God, yes, he will discipline us in many ways. He will instruct us, he will teach us, but he will also walk with us as a good father and hold our hand and lead us to everlasting life. But that will require you on your part to maintain that relationship because relationships work both ways. Be disciplined by God and have the self-discipline to follow him with all of your heart and love him with all of your heart. And how do you start that? Well, obviously you have to believe in God's word and you just heard it. Then you confess him as Lord and transform your mind, change your mind. That's where repentance is. Change your mind and seek him diligently more than anything else. And then after that, make a vow to him through baptism, according to Acts chapter 22, verse 16, and walk with him in the light so he can constantly discipline us, shape us, forge us, and prepare us for everlasting life. If anyone is here and ready to do that, or if anyone needs the prayers of the congregation, please come forward as we stand and praise our Lord.